You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the Heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for March 1st, 2024. This week, some comments on Western AFib, aspirin use, cannabis use, left and trigger ejection fraction in athletes, and shared decision-making before ICD implantation. Before I start, I want to say a few words on the Western AFib Congress that was in Park City, Utah last weekend. First, of course, thank you to my friend, Dr. Nasir Marouche, for the invite to this incredible meeting. It's a remarkable two days of lectures on AF. I had two assignments, and one was to be on a panel discussing the topic, Every Patient with AFib Deserves a PVI. Now, that's obviously a provocative topic. There was indeed a spirited discussion about doing PVIs and how earlier is better than later. One of the main comments I made was to say that back in the early days, 20 years ago, when I was learning AFib ablation, I set a Google alert for the term AF ablation. And I did this to pick up tips and tricks and because in those days uh, we were all learning and the Google alerts did bring a lot of tips and tricks, it worked. But in recent years, these Google alerts mostly point me to business stories on how big the AF ablation market is and is going to be. And it's especially crazy these weeks and months because all the industry players are marketing this new way to kill atrial myocytes, and that's with pulsed field ablation, or PFA. The marketing with PFA rivals that of left atrial appendage closure. Now, my thinking, though, is that a sign of being more advanced as a field would be if we actually did fewer PVIs because that would mean we'd have done something to stop the massive increase in AVIB incidence, Say, perhaps if we learn more about the upstream causes of AFib, likely we would need fewer PVIs. I try to remind my EP friends that while the PVs are easy to isolate, we don't really know why we do it. And sure, in, in some cases there's focal AFib and there's an atrial driver inside the PVs, but these cases are pretty rare. Just before our session at Western AFib, Uh, Dr. Eric Prostowski showed that famous cartoon of the person looking for his car keys in the dark. Where was he looking? Under the light post, because that was the only place he could see. That image has really got me thinking about how little our knowledge base has advanced since we started doing PVs. Anyways, you'll be seeing lots of news stories in AF ablation because of pulse field ablation. I'm not sold on it yet. The first generation PFA catheters are pretty rudimentary. Uh, Maybe in a few years, the delivery system will be improved and we can adopt it. But still, PFA is just another way to burn myocytes. It doesn't advance our knowledge of AFib. I'm afraid, actually, that by exciting the field about doing more PVI, pulmonary vein isolation, It might even slow our knowledge about AFib even more than it already is slowed. All right, aspirin. Aspirin is back in the news again. I like talking about aspirin because A, there are a bunch of trials to interpret. B, it's directly relevant for cardiac prevention. And C, it's not entirely clear how to translate this trial data. The most recent data is now about five years old. In 2018, which seemed like yesterday, There were three primary prevention trials published. The take home from these three trials was that there was no net benefit to primary prevention aspirin. The small reductions in non-fatal events was countered by an increase in major bleeding. But, yes, there's always a but, most of these patients were not taking aspirin at the time of trial enrollment. So, these were essentially studies of starting aspirin. 
But that's not exactly the main scenario I see in my office. In my office, I mainly see patients on aspirin and the question of de-prescribing comes up. To be honest, I've been recommending stopping the aspirin, especially when patients are on oral anticoagulation. Well, a four-author group, two from Australia and two from Ireland, had the idea to meta-analyze these three trials looking specifically at patients who were on aspirin before the trial and were then randomized. The first author was Dr. Ruth Campbell. So that means part of this group are randomized to stopping the aspirin. This is a good study idea because it comes up so often in the office. A previous observational study from Sweden found that patients in their registry who stopped aspirin had a 28% higher risk of cardiovascular events. Now, of course, that's an association, but if it was causal, that is a big risk. The three 2018 primary prevention aspirin trials had more than 40 to 7,000 patients, about 15% or about 7,000 patients were taking aspirin before enrollment. Now, of note, we're actually only meta-analyzing two because the ARRIVE trial uh, excluded patients on aspirin. So these 7,222 participants provided a chance to evaluate outcomes based on randomization to continue or stop aspirin among baseline users of aspirin. The authors were able to get the source data from the authors of Esprit and Descent, and the main findings were that yes, yes, when they compared CV events to the 3,500 aspirin users randomized to placebo, that is, stopping the aspirin, versus those randomized to continuing the aspirin, there was a 21% higher risk in those stopping the aspirin. The hazard ratio, 1.21, 95% confidence intervals range from 1.05 to 1.39, and the absolute increase was quite a lot, 450 events versus 374 events in these groups of 3,600 patients. The risk for major bleeding was not significantly different in the aspirin stoppers versus the aspirin continuers. Hazard ratio was 0.86, and the conference intervals went from 0.68 to 1.10. So my comments, this is provocative data, isn't it? A 21% risk increase is a lot. This approaches the sweetest observational data, and there was not a huge harm reduction in terms of less bleeding. Now, before we go further, we should say that all meta-analyses are basically observational studies. This is indeed an exploratory analysis. Relative to new users of aspirin, previous users was a much smaller group. Now, to really answer the question, you'd need to do a properly powered RCT of aspirin users and study de-prescribing with randomization versus continuing. Interesting, though, was that in each of the trials, there was, a, there was not a significant subgroup interaction based on aspirin use before the trial. And I went and looked up the Esprit trial in the New England Journal of Medicine. Recall that Esprit was the aspirin primary prevention trial in the elderly. So the risk reduction in Esprit in previous aspirin users was 0.78, 22% reduction, versus 0.98 in non-users. The P for interaction did not reach significance because of the low numbers, but again, that's a 22% reduction and it's similar to the findings of the meta-analysis. Now, the most obvious or common explanation of the finding that previous users do worse when the aspirin is stopped is a survivor bias. That is, people who have taken aspirin for a long time have shown that they can tolerate the drug. It actually reminded me of the EP clinic I used to do with Dr. Zipes back in the 1990s. This was a few years after a CAS trial and the removal of Enconide from the market. Patients would come to our clinic in Indianapolis and were able somehow to get Enconide from us. And I remember asking Dr. Zipes, I'm like, hey, what about CAST? And I remember his response was that he said that these patients had been on the drug safely and effectively for years, decades even. They're tolerating it fine. The meta-analysis of aspirin users and non-users also reminds me of the frail AF study. Remember, Northern Netherlands, elderly frail patients doing well on warfarin were randomized to staying on warfarin or switching to DOAC. Well, frail AF was stopped early because those who stayed on warfarin did so much better. I have to say, I think this analysis really makes me question my practice of stopping the aspirin in patients who have been on it a long time. Let me know what you think, but... 
Looking harder at this study makes me less certain about my deep prescribing practice. Wait, wait, isn't that almost always true? That is, a deeper look at evidence always makes us less certain than more certain. All right, cannabis, cannabis study. The Journal of the American Heart Association has published a study correlating cannabis use and cardiovascular outcomes. The top line results were that cannabis associates with higher rates of cardiovascular events. More than 100 news sites have covered the study. Pediatric News had the headline, quote, It sure looks like cannabis is bad for the heart, doesn't it? And this paper even made the Today Show, which is a big deal. Veteran journalist Sue Hughes, however, writing for the Heart.org Medscape Cardiology, had excellent coverage. Her first sentence included the top line results, which is normal. But her second sentence started with the phrase, quote, however, the study has many limitations. Indeed, this is true. Here is what the four authors did. They used data from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey from 27 American states. I didn't know what that was, so I looked it up. This is a telephone survey conducted by the CDC in which they call Americans and ask them questions. Everything is self-reported. Cannabis use is self-reported. Demographics, age, weight, and get this, even cardiovascular events are self-reported. As in, they ask people, have you had a stroke, MI, or coronary heart disease? Then they form three groups of cannabis users, non-users, non-daily users, and daily users. Then they did correlations. They did some minor adjustments, such as smoking, self-reported, of course, age, weight, diabetes. They did not know blood pressure or lipids or really much else. They reported that cannabis use associated with a higher rate of cardiovascular events. The odds ratio for a composite of coronary heart disease, MI, or stroke was 1.28 or 20% higher for daily users versus non-users. Elevated risks were also seen regardless of smoking. There also seemed to be a dose-response curve, meaning more cannabis, more risk. The authors list seven limitations, but they still make strong conclusions and the senior authors told journalists that, quote, cannabis has cardiovascular risks. And their clinical perspective in the journal reads, quote, patients should be screened for cannabis use and advised to avoid cannabis to reduce their risk of premature cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular events. My comments. This is an extremely weak observational study. It's all from a phone survey, like everything. For instance, when I look at their main table, it looks like cannabis is highly protective in those who drink alcohol. The odds ratio here was 0.72 with confidence intervals going from 0.64 to 0.81. So should we tell people who drink daily to take cannabis to reduce their cardiovascular risk? Of course not. This study is fatally flawed because people who smoke cannabis are different from those who do not. Not only that, how about people who would talk with someone with a CDC versus those who would hang up? Do you really think that data derived from a CDC phone survey in people who smoke weed every day is going to provide reliable data? Now, if I had to put a bet down on cannabis, I'd suspect that daily use is likely not a net positive for any health, but studies this week are not the way to sort out this knowledge. I saw someone online say, isn't this the way we found out that smoking was harmful? And I would answer, not really. Causation in smoking fulfills many of Bradford Hill's criteria. Cohort studies showed a consistent relationship or correlation. There was a strong dose response curve and cessation of smoking reduced risk. And the plausible mechanism, mechanisms are there, such as platelet aggregation and endothelial dysfunction. The thing that bothers me about cannabis, scientifically that is, is that because it has been a banned substance, we have had very little data on its potential benefits and harms. Hopefully, with decriminalization in many areas, we'll learn more, but not from these sorts of methodologically weak studies. And finally, I will say this again, and I say it so often, every time authors do such a study, and a journal publishes it, and health news sites mindlessly cover it, all for attention, trust in medical science diminishes. The one exception we have here is Sue Hughes from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology, so good on her. All right, next topic is low ejection fraction in athletes. 
Circulation has published an interesting paper in December of 2023 on sports cardiology. It is this matter of seeing a slightly low EF in highly trained athletes. I missed this paper, so I'm reporting on it now. I see a fair number of athletes, so I've seen this phenomenon and I don't know what to make of it. I often have the athlete do a bunch of push-ups before the echo because getting their adrenaline up or exercise seems to improve the ejection fraction. But still, why? Why would an elite endurance athlete have a measured left and trigger ejection fraction of, say, 46%? Well, a group of Belgian and Australian investigators have published a very nice study of 281 elite athletes. The authors did a battery of tests on these cyborgs, and they followed them over time. There were seven main findings. First, 44 of 281, or 16% of the athletes, had a reduced ejection fraction on CMR. 12 with a low LVEF, 14 with a low RVEF, and 18 with both RV and LVEF reductions. However, age, sex, BMI, blood pressure, sports type, training loads were similar between a low and normal EF group, so there were no easy clues of why this happens. Second main finding, athletes with lower ejection fraction more frequently met criteria for reduced left ventricular global longitudinal strain. And consistent with this, there was a moderate negative correlation such that lower EF was associated with a reduced global longitudinal strain. Late gadolinium enhancement, LGE, a marker of macroscopic fibrosis, was present in 16% of all the athletes with no difference between the reduced EF and normal EF groups. All 10 10 athletes with reduced EF had LGE in the interventricular septum at the hinge point of RV attachment. This was also the most common site of LGE in those with normal EF, but but four athletes in the normal EF group had mid-epicardial lateral wall fibrosis. Fourth finding, during exercise, the reduced EF group picked up vigorously and had greater gains in EF during exercise perhaps because they started from a lower EF point. Heart rate and power outputs were similar at peak exercise between the normal and reduced EF groups. Fifth finding, as for rhythm monitoring, the reduced EF group had more PVCs, though the absolute number of PVCs per day were still pretty low. Sixth finding, genetics-wise, and I think this was the main focus of the study, The authors used a polygenic risk score, which is a constellation of gene variants associated with dilated cardiomyopathy. The goal was to determine if there was a genetic component to the reduced EF seen in these athletes. The PRS, or polygenic risk score, was significantly higher in athletes with reduced EF compared to those with normal EF. Though when graphed out, the differences to me look small. The caveat here is that I'm way over my skis when it comes to evaluating polygenic risk scores. In a multivariate analysis that included age and fitness, male sex and greater polygenic risk scores were the only significant predictors of a reduced ejection fraction. And the final finding is that during 4.5 years of follow-up, no athlete had heart failure or documented sustained arrhythmia. One athlete died from trauma, the other died of sudden death. The athlete did have a abnormal RVEF and a low normal LVEF. This person's PVC count was about 3,000 per day. He had no LGE, but he did have a high genetic risk. A postmortem exam revealed microscopic evidence of patchy fibrosis of both ventricles, and that suggested the possibility of a cardiomyopathic process. But testing of cardiomyopathy genes was negative and he had undergone testing for performance-enhancing drugs that was negative. My comments. This is a very nice paper. First author is Guido Clayson. It's in circulation. I'll link to it. Though it still leaves a lot of unanswered questions. It's still weird for athletes to have a lowish ejection fraction. You don't expect it. But it seems real, right? Global longitudinal strain was off in this group, and they had more PVCs. The good news, at least in this small sample, is that it does not look to be a bad prognosis. Power output is similar on exercise testing, and none of these patients developed heart failure or arrhythmias. The gene variant connection seems a bit weak to me, 
Yes, there was a, a statistically significant relationship to a polygenic risk score, but A, I don't know what that means, and B, it seems like a pretty small effect size. Now, when I see athletes with low SGFs, I can recall this study and feel relatively assured, though we definitely need more data and information. One question or thought that came to my mind, and the authors did not mention this, is that I wonder if alcohol could be a factor in some of these low ejection fractions. For instance, they cited a study of Tour de France riders from years ago, I think the 1990s, and a similar percentage had lowish EF. Do these athletes partake in alcohol? I mean, alcohol use probably isn't common in endurance athletes, but a recent story in the cycling news implicated alcohol in a very famous rider's poor performance. And cyclists are people too. So again, take a look at this study. I look forward to more information from this group. It's a really nice paper. All right, final topic is a short one. Shared decision-making and ICD use. JAMA Internal Medicine has published a research letter looking at ICD use for primary prevention after the shared decision mandate, which CMS imposed in 2018. This mandate required doctors to perform shared decision-making, and we had to use a specific shared decision-making tool, and that was before primary prevention ICDs. Most of us use Dr. Dan Motlock's uh, University of Colorado shared decision-making tool, which is superb. So this was a cohort study, and it took a random sample of 20% of patients in CMS data. They looked at the rate of new ICD implants before and after the 2018 mandate. They also compared primary prevention ICD implants, which required shared decision-making, to secondary prevention ICD implants, which did not require it. So the two main findings, before the mandate, primary prevention ICD use was decreasing at a significant rate, 2.37 procedures per 100,000 beneficiaries per month. They found no significant differences in that rate after the mandate. And when they compared the primary prevention group with the secondary prevention group, there was a significantly monthly reduction of 2.86 primary prevention ICDs per 100,000 beneficiaries. However, they noted that this difference was likely due to a reduction in the decline of secondary prevention ICDs after the mandate. Now, the secondary prevention ICD rate didn't go up, but the rate of decline plateaued. The authors concluded that a broad mandate for shared decision-making did not influence usage of the ICD. They wrote that this goes against a paper published in 2013, which found an association between shared decision-making and fewer preference-sensitive procedures. The authors also commented that while they noted a statistically significant difference between primary and secondary prevention implants after the mandate, this was most likely not, not due to a decrease in primary prevention ICDs, but rather a quite remarkable plateau or almost increase in the rate of secondary prevention ICDs. They speculated that this could have been due to doctors coding more ICD implants as secondary prevention. Comments. I highlight this study because I want to say something about shared decision-making. Shared decision-making should never, ever, ever be used to decrease usage of any procedure. CMS may have mandated for that reason, but that is a morally and ethically bankrupted reason. Shared decision-making is good medicine. Many of the decisions we make in cardiology, aspirin, statins, treatment to different blood pressure goals, AF ablation, are all preference sensitive. You could even argue that all medical decisions are preference sensitive. I define good medicine as the most evidence-based, thoughtful therapy that aligns with a patient's goals and preferences. I probably use the phrase preference-sensitive five to ten times every day in clinic, and I hope you do too. I am glad that this study found no significant change in ICUs after the mandate. And of course, mandating shared decision-making was a really bad idea because it would be like mandating being a good doctor. So that's it for this week in cardiology. As always, I'm grateful that you listened. Thank you. And remember, friends, if you like this podcast, please take the time, give us a rating, write us a review. If you disagree with me on something, go to the heart.org Medscape Cardiology and write a comment. I always learn from these. Until next week, 
This is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. And uh, medicinal product trials versus non-medicinal product trials were more likely to have summary results. And the authors found no differences per multicenter status or industry-sponsored status. The authors summarized their findings by writing that only half of trials led by Nordic medical universities were reported in adherences to WHO recommendations. Timely results were even more rare at 2%. Among EU clinical trial registrations for which the practice is now mandatory, the proportion was only 7%. For 22% of trials, planned to involve more than 83,000 participants, no results could be located regardless of the time limit. And here is a big one. Contrary to established recommendations, almost half of the registrations were made retrospectively, which of course limits their usefulness. So my brief comments on this, the authors stress that they are not picking on Nordic countries. This has also been reported in Germany, and these Nordic results were similar. Canada has done better, but still with room for improvement. A cited paper from Canada found 59% of trials were pre-registered prospectively, and 39% had reported results. Poland has had especially good numbers of reported trials. We should first set out some of the limitations of this paper. As the authors do state clearly, some of the trials may have been listed as completed in clinicaltrials.gov, but never really finalized. I mean, sometimes people put trial ideas up on the clinical trial site just to sort of patent their ideas, so to speak. Now, this may be especially true for smaller trials. However, the best argument that their findings are true is that industry-sponsored trials had equally low reporting as seen in the appendix figure 9. So, my summary. As a reader of medical science, I had no really idea that massive amounts of data remain unpublished. Now, what's in that trove of data? We don't know. One example that comes to mind is the rosaglitazone story. So, rosaglitazone had a signal of increased cardiac events in their seminal trial, but it not quite reached statistical significance. Then, Dr. Steve Nissen from the Cleveland Clinic obtained oodles of unpublished trial results. And when they combined that data, meta-analyzed that data from the unpublished results with the published results, they found much stronger signals of cardiac events, and now we know that there's a cardiac signal with rosaglitazone. Of course, not every story of unpublished data will be so dramatic, but the point here is twofold. One, patients have been experimented on, and it is both moral and ethical to report results. And secondly, the scientific enterprise is diminished without all of the published data. So that's it for this week in cardiology. As always, I'm grateful that you listened. Thank you. And remember, if you like this podcast, please take the time to give us a rating. Write us a review. If you have something to say, go to the heart.org Medscape website. There's a place to comment. Leave me a comment. Teach me something. Until next week. This is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape.